Welcome everybody to the last um, top local webinar for this spring. Um, I will preface by saying we do hope to have more webinars, you know, maybe once it gets cold again in the fall, but we're going to wrap things up for the spring and we just want to thank you all so much for attending. We hope you've gotten a lot of value um, out of this series. I know our team has certainly learned a lot throughout the process um, and we hope, you know, you've benefited from these resources. Um, you can always visit sell.choplocal.com um, and under the local meat marketing resources tab, find the recordings for all of the webinars. Um, we hope you will go back and watch them again if, if that um, would serve you. So um, super excited to have you on tonight. Um, we are having Matt LaRue back. If you joined us back in February for Matt's um, Marketing 101 webinar, you know um, he has a lot of expertise in this area. And so we hope you'll gain a lot from tonight's presentation. As always, we like to cover a little bit about Chop Local. Um, so Chop Local is an online farmer's market specifically for meat. So if you are a farm or butcher shop selling meat direct to consumer um, and want to go ahead and move your sales online, um, or maybe you are already doing so and looking to make a change, um, we'd love to chat with you about what it would be like to be a vendor on Chop Local. Um, we offer a cost-effective solution for you to be able to sell your meat online while also taking care of the technical side of things um, so you don't have to take the, on that challenge alone. If you're interested in selling your meat on Chop Local, um, we just ask that you go to sell.choplocal.com slash sellocalmeat um, and go ahead and fill out our vendor inquiry form. We'll then just have a member of our team reach out to you, um, learn a little bit more about your operation and talk about what it's like to be a vendor on Chop Local um, and then move forward from there. I also wanted to talk about tonight that um, there is a special offer as a Chop Local vendor that you will be able to create. Um, an account on the meat price calculator, which is, allows you to um, save and edit your price list, which we know is a super helpful tool as you're thinking about um, pricing your meat products. And I won't go too far into that because I know Matt will cover that throughout the presentation, but did just want to mention that as a Chop Local vendor, you do have that added perk. So we're really excited to offer that. Um, but without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass things over to Matt. Um, we have the Q&A feature enabled, so go ahead and um, throw your questions in there throughout the presentation, and we'll get to those um, once uh, Matt wraps up. All right. There, now you, you you just have the slide. Yeah, great. Thanks for nodding. All right, so thank you. Um, I'm pleased to talk about this topic. It's one of my favorites. Uh, yeah, I hope, I hope that a lot of you were around on the February presentation that was about uh, consumer-oriented marketing, uh, understanding and, and you know, choosing a target consumer and directing your efforts at those folks. Because um, while tonight I'm gonna talk about about pricing, which kind of feels like, you know, marketing is a, a big gray cloud and, and pricing is very black and white. Uh, the two are very closely linked and I'll, I, I probably alluded to that link back in February, but I'll uh, mention it again tonight as I go through uh, my, my uh, presentation. Uh, what I'm gonna cover tonight are some observations that I've done. They're here in New York state, so they're not uh, you know, we're going to talk about prices that we're seeing in the market from just one market, which is local to, to me in New York, but it gives a context to that discussion. And I talk about an, a, one approach or, a, you know, sort of what almost call it a philosophy of setting prices. And I'm really going to focus on setting prices for individual cuts. Again, if you're selling online um, with something like Chop Local, you're selling essentially uh, individual cuts. You can be bundling them, but you still need to set a value for individual cuts when you create bundles. So I'm not really gonna talk about pricing carcasses like quarters and halves uh, based on a carcass weight. That said, um, if I don't remember to say it again, the, the meat price calculator tool that we'll give an orientation to does allow you to set prices for carcasses. And that process on the tool is much simpler than the process for pricing meat by the cut, which is what I'll, um, what I'll mostly talk about. 
Okay, then I'm going to talk about the approach, the logic behind the meat price calculator, and then do a demo of a, a price list on the on the tool, and then just kind of wrap up with some notes and again make that tie back to marketing. So uh, I'm going to cover something about prices that we're observing in the market, just to give us some context about price, and uh, to bring you know to bring up these issues that when consumers are surveyed about locally raised meat, and, I, and I've done my own survey of 200 consumers, they report that, you know, uh, one reason they don't buy locally raised meat is because they perceive that it, it costs more. Uh, in addition, and I'm, you know, this is getting a little dated now, but as of about a year ago, consumers had been seeing uh, grocery store prices on meat rise by 30% over the course of 18 months. Some prices have started to relax a little bit, but uh, there's also still a lot of high prices to be found. And, and I think there's an argument that prices will remain high uh, for a while. Well, you know, high, high, high is relative term, but um, higher than they used to be. Uh, so in this context, we asked the question during the summer of 21, how do farm prices compare with grocery store prices? And again, um, in, in context of consumers saying, you know, in a farmer's market example, no, I don't go to the farmer's market to buy meat because the meat there is too expensive, uh, which is what we were hearing from them. So here's what we did. We went to farmer's markets uh, and looked at the prices that farms were advertising. Um, um, we also went to grocery stores and looked at the prices. Now, the grocery stores, we were limited to just looking around the Ithaca, New York you know, region, that's where I live. And um, so that's where the grocery stores that, I, that were available to me. And I looked at the prices on a selection of cuts a couple of times uh, during these months in the summer of 21. Uh, these seven grocery stores are ordinary grocery stores. Uh, they are not uh, specialty stores that feature local meat, let's say, for example, they weren't natural food co-ops. They were, um, you know, included things, stores like Walmart, Target, and Aldi, and then some regional chains that are just sort of full line grocers. And then we went to farmers markets and, and farm stores uh, all around New York. So we have Ithaca grocery stores, and then we have farms from all around the state. So we'd get a better blend of farm prices. And those prices came from 17 different farms. So it's it's not a it's an imperfect comparison because it's Ithaca grocery stores and then um, you know full New York farmers farm prices, but still um, instructive. We looked at a few uh, different cuts that I felt were a nice selection of different value. Uh, you know maybe looking at different customers. So we have the sirloin steak, ribeye steak, chuck roast, and ground beef. When it comes to beef, for pork we looked at uh, pork loin bone-in chops and ground pork. That's unseasoned ground pork, not sausages. And for lamb, we would lump together either rib or loin chops, but no shoulder chops, and then ground lamb. So these are all the cuts we were observing. And then um, we divided all of the products by production system or other relevant claims. So uh, in the grocery stores, we would find uh, what we're going to call conventional products. These, these were mainly products that really didn't have a label claim or that would say uh, something like all natural, which you know USDA defines as minimally processed and doesn't really reflect the point of differentiation. Um, but then products that were slightly differentiated from conventional, we called level one, meaning level uh, one level of differentiation. So this would be products that um, said no antibiotics or no added hormones on them. And of course, any product that was being sold by a farm at a local market um, was differentiated as local. So all farm products were automatically classified as level one. And then level two was even further differentiated. So if products said that they were pasture raised uh, in the case of pork and, and uh, chicken, uh, if they said they were grass fed and they had to say 100% uh, or strictly or something like that, or if they were certified organic, then we're saying, okay, those products are even further differentiated. So now we classified them all into these groups. So here's just an example of a, a product. This is how we did our price collection. We go in, we look at this, we record the unit price, which is $15.99 a pound. Uh, and this uh, ribeye steak doesn't have any 
claims on the label. Uh, so it's just classified as conventional. And, and yeah, the unit price is the price per pound. It just so happens that this steak was cut at exactly one pound. So it also costs $15.99. Here's another product at Wegmans uh, grocery store. Now this product says that it's USDA certified organic and it's 100% grass fed. So it gets bumped into the level two classification. The, report, the, the price you can see right there on the shelf is $7.69 a pound. And then we looked, uh, you know, here's another example just to get you used to what we were doing. This uh, would be called a level one uh, pork product. It says raised without antibiotics, also happens to say group house and vegetarian fed. And this was $5.99 a pound. So that's how we did our price observations at grocery stores and at farmers markets. And here are the results for beef. Again, this is summer of 21. And so this is, if you think back to, you know, that time, it's really when um, price increases were, were still fresh on the consumer's mind. Uh, but I think they hadn't quite reached farms yet. And what we found is that you know, on average, grocery store prices were higher than farm prices. So if we look at, uh, I know there's a lot on this slide and you'll be able to access this chart of prices um, on the meat price calculator website and I'll point that out later. So don't worry about trying to write anything down. Uh, but you can see that like on the chuck roast, for example, a conventional chuck roast, the average price from 13 observations at those grocery stores was $7.17. Uh, but if that product was differentiated by, by production system level one, then we saw that the price went to $11.49, sample size of three. Uh, meanwhile, farms were selling uh, a similar product for $6.43 a pound. And then if we get over into the level two, you know, 100% grass fed or certified organic um, products, we see that the grocery stores were charging $8.45 and the farms are charging 6.85. Uh, and you can see the sample size there with the N equals. So one thing that is surprising, uh, that was surprising to me was to find that these grass-fed, 100% grass-fed products were being priced lower than uh, grain finished, no antibiotics, no added hormones products at the grocery stores. And indeed, um, sometimes even at the farmer's markets, but uh, you know, I guess if we were all sitting in the same room, I'd say, why do you think that is? Well, um, what I suspect is that the grass-fed products uh, in the case of beef are usually coming from South America and in the case of lamb from New Zealand and Australia, while the, um, you know, with the level one, we sometimes just call it natural beef, even though that's not the right term. Um, the level one, no antibiotics, no added hormones, you know, grain finished beef was usually coming from US farms. And, and so, yeah, those grocery chains and their suppliers had a higher cost to source that product, and that's why they were pricing it higher. So just an unexpected observation from this was um, that matrix of prices. But what I want you to see is that in general, farm prices were uh, lower than grocery store prices on beef, and you, you'll be able to access those prices later. Uh, when it came to pork and lamb, our farm prices were a little bit closer and sometimes even higher than grocery store prices, but once again, in, in general, um, we found that the store prices were, were you know, equal to or higher than farm prices. So pretty uh, interesting uh, to find that out. And to me, what my conclusion was, was, you know, first of all, we have the consumer perception, which um, is working against us, I suppose, if our prices actually are lower than the stores. But really, um, I think that individual farms cannot get packaged meat products out to consumers more efficiently than grocery store chains and, and big suppliers. And therefore, as a farm, uh, you know, as farm operators, we're underpricing and undervaluing our products because we simply can't get them out there, um, you know, cheaper than the stores can. So this is an opportunity for New York farms to increase prices. Now, I've, I've spoken on this topic many times since then. Uh, especially here in New York, where I've been promoting the meat price calculator. And we repeated these observations last summer, more limited selection, um, just looking at groceries, or sorry, just looking at farmer's market prices uh, at eight different farmer's markets from 18 farms. And we did see some price corrections where farms were bringing their prices up higher than they had the previous summer, 
probably somewhat in response to seeing inflation and seeing meat prices. Uh, maybe I hope in some response to our extension efforts to educate producers on pricing. But you know the takeaways from observing prices, and it's useful to go and look at the prices on at, at grocery stores and on other sources, maybe even on other online sources if you're selling online. But um, one thing is to you know not worry about increasing your prices as needed um, over fears that consumers are going you know are, won't like high prices or won't like your prices if you raise them. Because remember, as we just saw, you know at least I can say from the summer of 21, that consumers were already paying these, you know, quote, high prices for meat in regular grocery stores. And these were consumers who were just walking into the grocery store, looking for a meat product, not looking for something that's differentiated by the farm's location or production system. So keep in mind my second point that consumers that are seeking these products, again, whether from their own region or differentiated, for some reason about breed or feeding system or handling, um, those consumers, uh, as we talked about in my first show, they're not primarily seeking that product based on price. They're seeking it for other products. So they, they, are, they already value what you produce and that increases their willingness to pay, right? So as I said here, local meat target consumers already value farm products and will be less price sensitive than uh, let's just say an ordinary grocery shopper. Also, don't conclude that price increases from the farm are going to um, necessarily uh, mean less cash sales if, if a few customers do decide to buy less or not to buy when they see the new, the new price. So just because uh, you sell fewer units in the same amount of time but at a higher price, it doesn't mean that you'll earn less money. And I set up a little example for you uh, from the 2021 price observations the um, average farm price for ground beef, level one ground beef was $6.29. If you were a farm selling at that average price and you typically sold 80 pounds in a month, then you were grossing $503. If you raised your price only to match the grocery store average at the same time, which was significantly higher at 785, you could afford to lose 16 customers or sell 16 fewer units, maybe customers that ordinarily buy two pounds, step down and only buy one pound, right? So you could afford to lose 16 um, units in the same period uh, and you'll still be essentially grossing the same amount of money. But if you didn't lose any consumers, which I think is probable, then uh, of course you'd be grossing more. So just don't worry that, um, you know, within reason price increases uh, are going to result in um, less gross sales because of fewer units sold. Um, also, I wouldn't recommend changing your price straight from 629 to 785. I'd probably do that incrementally, you know, over the course of time, because that would be a that would be a jarring uh, price change for some folks. All right, so switching the gears a little bit from uh, observations that we had in our region and talking about the approach um, to setting prices. And, you know, I think that um, university and extension sometimes have this, maybe this concept that there's a right, there's a right price or there's a right methodology. And uh, what I, I think that a lot of, you know, a lot of us are in farming for all sorts of different reasons. And so um, what I wanna say is pricing should begin with the farm's financial goals. You define, the goals that you have for your operation, um, the scale of it, the time that you put into it, and just make sure that your prices are delivering what the farm's financial goals are. And they should include an estimate of, you know, the, 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 the goal for gross sales, what you expect to retain as profits, the you know, profits that you want to draw off the farm and um, that you want to reinvest in um, other stuff on the farm. And then, you know, work out those numbers. So if we had a hypothetical example we said, yeah, you know, we want to gross $100,000 a year from this farm, um, no assumptions about how much of that will be kept as profit, then you can start to take the $100,000 and divide it among your enterprises. And, and that would say all of your enterprises. If you're making hay, um, you could, uh, you know, and selling hay, you could put that in. You have uh, crops uh, and then species, you know, divide out that money on how much you want each uh, enterprise to generate 
and then look at the estimated units that you'll produce. And at least this gives you a starting point. So in my example, I divide the $100,000 up between beef and pork. I think we're, you know, we're gonna finish and harvest 26 animals this year for beef. Uh, and therefore our beginning target is to gross $2,692. This, this is a starting point to move you through the pricing process. Next, you're gonna consider the market channels that are available to you, uh, the market channels that you could use to sell the product. And I've kind of divided these channels up uh, on the bottom there. We have sort of like branded programs and, and commodity sales where you're going to be get, getting paid on a carcass weight and you don't have to arrange for processing. The, the buyer is gonna take care of that. So you're really gonna be loading animals on a trailer, sending them off. Uh, and then as we move up, we've got channels where you might be selling um, you know, sides or quarters or holes, still getting paid by the carcass, but where you need to arrange for the processing. So you've got grocers, butcher shops, restaurants that wanna buy you know, a whole lamb or a half a pig uh, every week or whatever they're buying, or you've got freezer trade customers that are buying quarters and halves. So you're selling by the carcass weight and you're arranging for processing. And then the channels at the top here, are where you're going to be selling meat by the cut that would include online sales, farmers markets, your, your farm store. Uh, and you, of course, you're going to be arranging for pricing and you're going to be paid on the, on the actual pounds that you sell, not on the carcass weight. As we think about all these different channels that we could sell meat in, we think about the relative price that we can receive. And so we think, okay, selling at farmers markets will bring us the highest price per pound. We can convert that into a price per pound hanging weight or a hot carcass weight. And then as we work our way down through these other channels, the price gets lower and lower to where, you know, I'm presuming that the lowest price uh, per pound carcass weight that we could receive is in commodity channels. That's not a ranking of sort of good and bad channels. That's a relative ranking of the price received. But remember that the price um, received is directly uh, tied to the amount of marketing effort that is required by the channel. And that's why I say this isn't sort of this uh, sense that you know high price channels are good channels and low price channels are bad channels. Actually, they can all function very well for the farm uh, and for your preferences about how much marketing effort and labor you wanna be involved in. So we're gonna take this into consideration as we work on pricing. And we're gonna recognize that different market channels cost different amounts of marketing effort in order to participate in them. And, and therefore, because of that, we have a pricing challenge. Uh, each channel has a different set of costs like I just reviewed. Okay, each cut on a carcass comes in a proportion that we call the yield. And then each cut has a level of demand, level of consumer demand in that channel. So think about maybe um, two communities, uh, one's urban, one's rural, something like that. Uh, where you know you might have a high demand for certain cuts in an urban market, turn around and go to a rural market and have more demand for for other cuts, right? So ground beef and roasts maybe sell better in the rural market or something like that. We have this different level of demand. Restaurants want you know particular uh, particular cuts uh, and so on. So all of these, all of this going on, to me makes pricing by the by the pound or by the cut confusing because of the costs, the yields, and the demand. And because of that, I'd say we need a unique set of prices for each unique channel that we, that we sell in. And to, um, to go to my example of two farmer's markets, uh, if, if you've got a farmer's market, let's just say in, in your hometown, um, and then you've got another one that's two hours away in a big city, those are unique channels. And I would have different price lists for those two channels um, because your cost, if only in the driving, your cost is higher in the market that's two hours away. And so your prices should reflect, reflect that. Um, if you're doing um, two farmer's markets in, in the same town, one's on Saturday, one's on Wednesday, you don't necessarily need two, two price lists in that because they're not really unique. Uh, but when it comes to selling wholesale, uh, sometimes people ask me, you know, Matt, what's the, what's the discount off retail that I should offer my wholesale customers? And um, I don't think there's a magic number that someone can tell you like, oh, it's, you always give them 30% off. No, you look at your channel and you look at your estimated labor, and then you develop a price for that channel. 
that's um, that's reflective of that and meets your your profit goals. So, yeah, different channels require different prices. Okay, in in fact, when we talk about different prices in different channels, sometimes people uh, confuse that with different levels of profit. Or sometimes people think, you know, yeah, when I sell online, I profit really well, but when I sell at the farmer's market, my profits are worse. And my question is in this pricing discussion, why would we expect different levels of profit in different channels? I would suggest that we create a scenario where the profit per head is fixed across all channels so that we guarantee that the farmer is going to receive the target, the goal, uh, the farm financial goal per head, regardless of where that animal goes. So let me give you a hypothetical example. And I just wanna stress these numbers are, are not real numbers, but um, let's just make an assumption that we've got a, a pen of steers and we're feeding them all the same. Okay, so our cost of production on these steers is all the same, regardless of whether the meat ends up at farmer's market, um, by the cut, selling to restaurants, by the cut, or selling uh, indiv you know, quarters to, to individuals in the freezer trade, right? Cost of production is the same. And for the sake of argument, we'll take all these animals to just the same processor. So now, um, and you know, carcass weights are close. So right, our cost of processing is the same across all these channels. Now what I'm suggesting is that we enter our desired profit per head fixed across all channels. So why do we need different sets of prices in these different channels? It's because our the cost of our time, the value of our marketing effort that's, that's our time, but also any fees that we pay, ads, advertising, you know, anything that we do like that for that channel. Our marketing uh, labor and, and marketing costs vary across these channels. And in the farmer's market, we're going to spend a lot of hours selling that meat. So we have a high marketing labor cost. Selling restaurant, you know, wholesale, uh, we just make deliveries once or twice a week. We have an order minimum for delivery, things like that. You know, these this is a more efficient channel, takes less time. And then freezer trade, uh, we're only selling quarters to four customers. We have to deal with those customers, but maybe a few are, are returning customers. And so, they, you know, that's very efficient. And so we can charge uh, different prices. We will gross different levels, but that's not a reflection on our profit. And so... I hope I've made that clear. And that's why I'm advocating for when you have unique channels, develop a unique price sheet for that channel. I guess this is a good time to tell this anecdote, which is uh, it's true. And you know, it makes me chuckle, but it's a good, it's a good story. Uh, I was giving this talk um, in Pennsylvania to a group of farmers and uh, one raised their hand and they said, you know, Matt, we have that exact scenario that you suggested. So we have a farmer's market, you know, in our hometown and then we drive two hours to sell at a farmer's market in Pittsburgh. And um, the farmer said, oh, you know, shouldn't we be concerned that the Pittsburgh customers, if they find out about our local farmer's market prices, that they're gonna be upset that our prices are lower at the other farmer's market? And I said, no, absolutely not. You tell those Pittsburgh customers, if they wanna drive two hours one way to save money on meat, why they should just go right ahead and do that, right? So it's four hours round trip. Are they gonna do that? No, right? That no one's gonna drive four hours to save money on meat. So you don't have to worry about using different price sheets in different markets. All right, I threw this slide in based on um, my discussion with the uh, CHOP local folks. I, I used to use this slide a lot. It, it, I want to reiterate the, the philosophy of pricing um, when you're doing direct-to-consumer sales, whether that's uh, in any of the channels that we reviewed. So what we really want to think about is that we do have multiple enterprises on the farm. And in essence, for accounting costs, we want to think about the idea that we're selling products on the farm from one enterprise to the next. And so each time we have one of these transactions, we need to account for the costs and the profit that we want to deliver to that enterprise. And then in essence, you know, purchase it at the next level. So at the simplest level, you could think, and I'm going to stick to my beef examples. If you only produced beef on your farm, you have a, a production enterprise, which uh, produces slaughter ready finished animals. And then you have a 
marketing business. That probably popped up for everybody, didn't it? There you go. Uh, and then you have a marketing business that buys slaughter ready animals, pays a processor uh, to produce packages of meat and puts in the marketing effort, right? So we're gonna have to come up with a price that the production, production um, enterprise sells those slaughter ready animals, those finished animals to the marketing enterprise at. And the reason we would need to do that is because of what we call opportunity cost, right? There is a market out there for finished animals and we could sell them there. Uh, but if we're going to choose to retain them in essence uh, by, by getting them processed and, and keeping meat and selling meat, there has to be a financial argument for why we're going to do that. And we can actually break the farm uh, or break this process into multiple enterprises where maybe we have a breeding herd and it has feeders, you know, feeder calves. Feeders can be sold on the market. Um, so you, you'd want to you know, look at your cost of production, build in a profit to sustain your breeding herd enterprise uh, and make sure that you're delivering um, uh, that fair price to yourself when you decide to retain those feeders and feed them out. And then you have a feeding and finishing operation. The other thing I'll say quickly is you could also buy feeders on the market. And it may be the case that you can buy them, uh, you know, quality feeders for a lower price than you're able to pr pr produce them. And that's that's another financial question. Uh, but then you have a feeding and finishing operation that finishes animals, gets them up to slaughter weight, uh, and then you sell that animal to your marketing business, which you incur more costs paying a processor, and then you get involved in the real marketing. So as we retain an animal along this slide from left to right, what we're doing is we're adding costs constantly, right? And therefore we're increasing the risk of a financial loss. If, if a calf dies the day after it was born, uh, down on the on the far left of this. Uh, yeah, there's a financial loss to the farm because you've kept that cow and now you've lost the, the calf. But take it all the way to the other end. If if all the meat from a finished steer is in a freezer and the freezer you know turns off and the meat all spoils, the financial loss is much greater. So that's what I mean by adding cost and increasing risk. Uh, I guess I'm a little bit of a pessimist because yes, we're also adding value. We are adding value, but I'm just thinking about the cost and the risk. So in order to justify the decision to get involved in increasing levels of cost and risk, we need a greater financial reward. And that's where pricing is gonna come into this discussion. We wanna make sure that we're getting paid and, and sort of rewarded for uh, the opportunities that we've not taken and for the end result. And I just wanted to bring that around in this discussion. Okay, so this is bringing us to the meat price calculator. This is a tool that uh, we created and, and it's online. It's, it's a Cornell uh, University resource and there is a free version for everyone. So any, anyone can use this for free, but there's also a level where you can create an account and save your data so you can log back in later and make little changes. You know, uh, once you work out your pricing uh, and I'll walk through those examples, but once you work through your pricing and then your processor increases you know the processing fees you can just log into the calculator edit the processing costs run to the end and edit the pricing of individual cuts to compensate for that increase versus um if you don't have an account then you just have to uh start from the beginning and run through the the pricing tool but yeah so this is for pricing meat by the carcass or by the cut and you will need data from your farm in order to use it successfully the thing that seems to uh, delay people using the tool is that you, you need to get a batch, an, an individual animal or a batch of animals processed and bring all that meat back to the farm and weigh it out so that you know the carcass weight and then you know the weights uh, of every cut that you have to sell or every sellable, sellable piece because you'll need to enter that in to work through the pricing example. Once again, I'll show that to you, but you, you, you will need to prepare with some data from your own farm. The approach of the meat price calculator is to basically accumulate all of your costs, including your profit goals. Uh, like I said, for, that, for each enterprise, the, the production enterprise has a production cost um, right here, cost of production. I know it's probably written really small, but that's what it says. And then also the production enterprise needs to be profitable. So we're going to have our cost of production that's sort of a break in, break even, and then we're going to have an additional sum that we add on for profit. 
and then we're going to keep accumulating costs. We have a trucking cost that's easy to keep track of that's driving the animals to the processor uh, and then driving back to pick up all the meat and perhaps even do deliveries to your customers if, if that's the channel you're working in. Then we have processing costs. This is the easiest record keeping because your processor will give this to you on an invoice. You'll have it all written down. You'll know carcass weight. You'll know the kill fee, the cut and wrap fee, and any additional processing costs all recorded on your invoice. So that's nice that they do that record keeping for you. Then you have the cost of marketing, and this is your estimate of the value of your time that you spend marketing in this channel um, in order to move all the meat from one animal. The meat price calculator operates on a one head example. Um, so you're going to come up with some, some estimate of the cost of marketing for one animal. And then remember that that cost of marketing, that's cost that you incurred, including if it's the value of your time and you don't have to write yourself a check to pay for that time, but you're still spending that time. Um, but in addition to that cost, the reason we're going through all this is to re receive better than market prices or to receive a, receive a greater reward for taking the risk. And so we have a marketing profit above and beyond the cost of marketing. That's sort of the why, why we're doing this. So get, gather all of these values, which are all dollars uh, for one animal and, and come up with a large sum and then essentially just take those dollars and then divide them out among all the cuts that we have to sell. And that's the pricing model that, that you see on the meat price calculator. Now, how do we decide how to divide those dollars out among the different cuts? Well, we do it based on our discussion. We do it based on their yield. So the number of pounds that we get from a carcass, some cuts are high yield, some cuts are small, lower yield. And we do it based on consumer demand. So we, when we have uh, very popular low yield cuts, then instinctively, you know, we realize we want to put higher prices on them. We have uh, less popular cuts that come in a large portion. And, you know, uh, uh, I have to pick on, you know, beef chalk and beef round together. They make up about 50% of the weight on a carcass. They're not always the most popular uh, primals. You know, so we have large yield, relatively low demand. We can use price, maybe a uh, lower price to help keep those cuts moving, but we just divide those dollars out based on yield and demand. And that's the pricing uh, example. I'm gonna hop on the meat price calculator and do a demonstration. Uh, but before I do, I just wanna review some of the numbers that are already filled in um, on the price tool. So one is the break-even cost of production. This is a hypothetical number, so please don't take it and use it as your own but I'm gonna use an example of pricing uh, beef cuts and say that my break-even cost uh, production for a finished animal is $1,300. And then in addition to the profit that I receive, I want uh, my production business, uh, sorry, in addition to the covering the cost, I want my production business to receive a profit of $100 per head. So we will see that when we get into the tool. Then we're going to talk about um, our marketing and, it, you know, probably you don't have an estimate of your cost of marketing per head. And this is the time to, you know, maybe start a little notebook that you keep in your pocket and just keep track of the time and the dollars that you spend on marketing. Any, any uh, associated fees, the advertising, and mostly the labor, and just sort of get an estimate of uh, your, your marketing cost in terms of your labor in different channels and certainly your other costs. And if you're shipping meat, you may want to include shipping prices uh, in your costs or your, you know, your cost for shipping. Uh, and then just come up with an estimate. So uh, I'm doing a farmer's market example and I'm saying, I think it will take me five farmer's markets where I have to spend eight hours. That's uh, an hour getting ready and packing up the, the truck and driving there, six hours selling and another hour packing up and driving back. And to value my time at $15 an hour. So I'm going to come up with, at, at minimum, a marketing cost of $600 per animal. Uh, and I came up with five farmer's markets uh, because I was thinking I'm selling about 80 pounds per farmer's market. So that gets me through a whole carcass. How much profit would I like in addition to paying for this time and this 
and this marketing effort, I want $500 a head. So I went, I went low on the production profit at $100 a head, but I went high on this and, and this isn't the right number for you or for everyone, but um, what I'm thinking is, why am I doing this, right? Why am I spending my Saturdays at this farmer's market? Why am I going through this effort, keeping these freezers with meat cuts in my, in my barn or in my garage or whatever? Why? Well, it's because I'm gonna get this reward. So this is the $500 per head in my mind. All right, with that said, I will hop onto the uh, meat price calculator for a demo. Uh, I guess uh, I just wanna say, you know, the meat price calculator is located at meatsuite.com. So MeatSuite is a resource that's for farmers in New York and North Carolina. Uh, it's not e-commerce, it's just a directory of farm products specifically focused on bulk meat, but uh, it's where you'll find the meat price calculator. So you'll visit meatsuite.com, come to the tab over here that says for farmers, click on that and you'll find the Cornell meat price calculator. I already have it open. Well, let me show you. Um, so when you click uh, that, you'll end up here. It's it's really, it's meatsuite.com slash calculator. Um, and you'll end up here. And so if you're able to create an account and that's for folks that uh, set up CHOP local accounts uh, or for farms that are in our sponsored states, which are New York, Massachusetts, North Carolina, then you can use this create an account tab. If you're not subscribing to CHOP Local or in one of these states, you can still use the exact same tool for free. It's just that you won't be able to save your data. So it's really important in that instance that you prepare all your carcass data, um, get all your stuff together, come on, use the site, and then keep track of that. So if you wanna make future changes, you can come back and use it. Also wanna point out this Get Prepared tab. So it tells you which data you'll need to gather when you when you click on this gather your data link. Uh, we have a meat cuts and weight sheet. It's it's very simple. You can do this with a notepad, but it's just formatted for you to bring all that meat back, weigh it out, and just make a record. You know, uh, ribeye steaks this many pounds, chuck roast this many pounds, and so on. Uh, the pricing pep talk is uh, about a three page uh, article that I wrote reflecting the New York State farmer's market and grocery store prices. So it has that table that I was using in my slides earlier with all the different um, beef, pork, and lamb prices that we observed in both places. And it also has some advice on how to raise prices uh, and you know be successful with that. And then finally, the video overview actually is a recording of me going through this, this presentation and this talk and doing the meat price calculator demonstration. So if you, you'll be able to access a recording of tonight's presentation, but you could also uh, look at these if you wanted. So that's what you'll find on the Get Prepared tab. When you do have an account and you log in, what you'll see is your dashboard. So this is mine and all the price lists that you've created. Uh, it'll tell you when you last updated a price list. So I did this one on March 21st, apparently. Um, it'll tell you which channel you were pricing for, so here's this farmer's market, which species, and then if you're pricing for cuts or for carcasses. So I was, when I did this East uh, Greenbush beef example, uh, I was pricing uh, beef cuts for, for a farmer's market. This list is complete and I can go and view it as a PDF or, or download it or print it. And then I can also copy this price list if I wanted to start editing it. So that's what I did for tonight is I copied that list and I have my example uh, price right here and we'll just work on uh, going through it as if it was a fresh price list. So we're gonna work through a farmer's market uh, beef by the cut example. Maybe, uh, don't worry, it's just cause it timed out and I suspected that, you know, that that was possible. Just give me a second. Figured if I talked too long, it would probably time out. Okay, for real this time. Nothing like demonstrating a website and then it doesn't work. Okay, so here's uh, what you see when you're working on a price list. There are four tabs here across the top. 
one's called your costs, then it's your prices, the results, and then the chance to revise prices. These first two tabs are the work that you have to do. Uh, the results are gonna tell you how it's going. And then the revised prices is, to me, that's the fun page. That's sort of the, I feel like we've almost turned meat pricing into a video game. That's where you get to go and play the game. But first you have to enter your data. So we'll start off on the your costs tab. And there are three sub tabs here. One's about production, processing and marketing, like I reviewed in my slides, because these are already filled in. You're gonna enter your break even cost of production for one animal of the species that you're pricing. And then your production profit goal that you wanna see for your production enterprise. Once you've got that in, you can go to the next step, which is processing. And so you're going to you know, use either an average from a group, take that average and call that average a single animal. Or if you don't have a lot of um, data on this, you know, on carcass weights and yields, then take the next batch of animals, uh, keep track of all of them, or even choose one very representative animal and just keep track for that single animal and then trust that it's representative of your herd. Don't pick the best looking animal you've ever had, pick something that's very average and typical for your farm. And so you're gonna to have to enter the carcass weight and then um, the kill fee or the slaughter fee that you're charged by your processor, the cut and wrap fee that applies to all pounds on the carcass, uh, because it's easy to keep track of. Like I said earlier, we, we include the trucking that's just driving the animal to the processor and then the delivery picking the meat back up. And there is a helper. If you wanted to work on your trucking cost, how many head did you truck? I took six, cost me $125 in fuel. It took me three hours and I'd like to value my time at $15 an hour. So it's saying in this instance, you you spent $28.33 per animal. I'm gonna to stick to my scripted $35 per head example. You can save and go to the next step, which is the marketing costs. So in my slides, I showed you an example. I think it's gonna take me these five farmer's markets. So I'm estimating my marketing effort. You, you can put whatever marketing costs you have into this, what's labeled marketing labor per head. Um, we're focusing on labor because that's, that's probably the most uh, limited resource and the most valuable but you can certainly include your marketing budget, um, uh, fees you pay at the farmer's market and other, you know, other costs that you have that are channel specific and that you can uh, get down to the per head level. The harder you work, the more uh, clear and, and accurate these numbers will be for your operation. But set, set, get yourself started and then you can always work on improving each iteration. So then in addition to my marketing cost, I want to be profitable with this marketing enterprises. The reason that I'm doing uh, this direct to consumer marketing, and so I'm gonna enter my $500 per head. Now I've worked across all the cost tabs, production, processing, and marketing. I can save and go to the next step, which is to enter my prices and my pounds. So for each cut that I receive back, I'm going to weigh it out when I get, when I get home from the processor and I pick it up. So I know the name of the cut, the total number of pounds I have, and then also enter the price that you're currently using. If you're creating a price sheet for the very first time, you can say that your current price is just $1 per pound. Yes, the, um, the calculator will conclude that you know, your prices are too low, at, too low at $1 per pound, but point is to just get an original price in there. But if you're already marketing in a channel and you wanna test to see if your current prices are delivering on your goals, then you would enter your current prices. So I'm just gonna you know, sit there and, and type each of these out. Um, fortunately, because I, I can save the data, that's all done. You don't have to watch me type. I do wanna point out that if you have um, some products with additional processing costs, like if we're having hot dogs made, we can put in um, that product, see how many pounds that we have, and then add an additional processing fee. So if the processor is charging me 35 cents a pound to make hot dogs, I can enter that additional processing cost here and it will only be calculated for those 11 pounds of hot dogs. And then again, enter the price, but I'm not gonna enter any of this for my example tonight, but I wanted to point out that you can account for 
smoking patties, sausages, hot dogs, and uh, anything that you that you have like that. When you've finished entering all your cuts and pounds, you can go to the results tab. And this is just going to tell you, again, if your current prices are meeting your goals that you've stated. So it's not, it's not really uh, a judgment of good or bad prices. It's just based on the data that you've entered and the goals that you've set, are you reaching them? So in this example, uh, I'm not going to meet my goals with my current prices. And it gives me some summary here. Um, what I need to do in order to reach the goal is gross $3,169 when all the cuts are sold from this one animal. But with my current price, I'm only going to gross 2630 So I'm coming up short by $538 per animal. And remember, I set a $500 marketing profit goal. What this really means in this example is that uh, I am basically covering my costs, but I'm not realizing uh, the profit goal or sort of the reward for my uh, added effort. I'll also tell you that your weighted average price across all cuts needs to be you know, at or above $8.14 a pound, but that your current pricing leads to a, a weighted average of $6.75. So again, telling you that you're coming up short We'll also give you the carcass to retail yield. So this is uh, the, the yield from the carcass into sellable pounds. If you, in, you know, I would include every pound you've got. So if you sell dog bones, soup bones, those things, put them all in when you're entering your cuts and your prices. And yeah, you may end up with um, a very high yield here, but understand that you're selling, you know, uh, you know these bones and these other these other items. Also gives you a breakdown of everything that you've entered thus far. So now we've done all the work and we get the reward of playing the game. We come to the revised prices tab. We're gonna have this reminder uh, floating on the top of the screen uh, of where we, need, where we need to go. And mostly we're gonna look at the gain loss uh, value over here, the negative $538. So we can begin to change prices and keep an eye on that number. And it's going to tell us if we're getting closer and closer to our goal. Now, when we were changing prices, the, we're going to look at the name of the cut, the number of pounds that we have in our current price, and then we can start uh, changing our prices. So here I've got my ribeye steak. I've got 23 pounds of it. I had it priced at $14. And you know, if I could raise it up to 19, you can see that I'm now only coming up short by $423. So I'll continue to change prices. Now the filet, I'm gonna go all the way from $15 a pound up to $25 a pound. But since there's only six and a half pounds, this doesn't have a huge impact. Um, but nevertheless, I'll change that price. I'll come up to short ribs. And uh, yeah, I have a scripted example. So I'm just following my script and changing my prices. And uh, frankly, this is giving, becoming a little dated. So these prices are all uh, still a bit low. But as I make these changes, um, you know, I'm going to be chipping away at that loss. And what I want to say here um, is it's, it's not just about dialing that, that value on the right side down to a zero or to a positive value, but it's also about inventory management. So think about the cuts that you sell out of in this channel, right, where this is a channel-specific price list. Think about the cuts that sell out very quickly in that channel and look as there an opportunity to increase those prices. And you're gonna use price increases in that instance to slow down consumer demand because we can use price to um, manage consumer demand and hopefully sell the pounds out of a carcass in, at, at a speed which more closely represents their proportion or their yield in the carcass. And that's, Really, um, in addition to dialing down our losses to a zero or a positive value here, we're also looking at uh, trying to regulate the speed at which cuts sell so that we're not running into you know, quickly selling out and then also backlogging other cuts. So once you hit a positive value, and I'll take my, my ground beef price and I'll raise it up and now see, 
I've, I've hit a positive value. So my price list works, it's delivering my goals. But I would say, don't just immediately leave the page. Think about the way that things sell in this channel and see if there's opportunities to actually continue to do some price increases on very popular, fast moving cuts. And then there might become enough wiggle room to possibly lower the price on some slower moving cuts. And remember that when, when you know, customers come to you uh, and they're seeking a certain cut and they see the price, that there's also an opportunity for you to move them into other parts of the carcass again and, and let customers help you solve inventory management, um, again, using price. So I'll stop there because I've, I've hit my goal so I can save and complete this price list and it will let me uh, print it out as a, as a PDF uh, and so on. But that's, that's the essential demo on the meat price tool. Okay, so that was at meetsuite.com. And um, I'm gonna just wrap up with a few more slides. What's the point of using something like the price tool and working on your pricing? Well, it's to test to test your current channels and really to test your prices in those channels and make adjustments to make sure that those channels are worth participating in and that they're delivering the farm's financial goals, that your marketing um, effort you know, may need to be revisited. It's a way to account for your labor, which is often an overlooked cost. Uh, again, not that you're going to literally write yourself a paycheck for each hour spent, but it's good when you're comparing the opportunities that you have, the marketing opportunities and the other opportunities for your time, that you account for the value of that time in that decision making. To evaluate and set prices for new opportunities, let's say you're, you're selling online or you're selling at, out of a, you know, a freezer on the farm and you get a call, uh, you know, we'd like to get local meat into our restaurant. Well, now you can at least begin to estimate your costs and develop a price sheet for that opportunity. It's a way to develop a set of prices that for each channel that you're using that you know works for the farm and that's helping you reach farm financial goals. It's also a way to manage the inventory of cuts that come with these relative levels of demand and yield. And that can get tricky in direct marketing. Uh, you know, one big um, difference between, let's say a grocery store and a farm that are selling meat is, you know, they can just order uh, just the pieces that they want, but we're working off an entire carcass. And so we need to move the entire carcass and that introduces an inventory uh, problem or an inventory challenge. So what does it mean if you develop a set of prices on the pricing tool, and then you determine that your customers in that channel would never pay those prices? And I'm kind of thinking um, to uh, a good friend of mine in extension, and I was giving this talk here in New York, and I gave the whole pricing and marketing talk. And at the end, he said, you know, Matt, that was really great, but I could never get those prices. All right, so what does that mean if you're thinking, well, if my customers would never pay that or I could never get those prices? It means a few different things. Uh, it may mean that you're operating in the wrong channel, uh, but it may also mean that you're not adequately supporting your prices with your marketing effort. And go back to my first talk and think about uh, identifying a target market and developing effective communication you know, understanding that consumer, developing the product that will satisfy them. These are the, the things that you do to support the prices that you receive. And for my friend who said, you know, I could never get those prices. I, I, I laughed. I said, no, I don't believe you could because your entire marketing effort is a sticker on the, tr on the door of your pickup truck. If that's your entire level of marketing effort, then I agree you could not, you could never receive these prices, right? It will take a greater amount of effort. That effort includes identifying the target market uh, in, in order to support and receive the prices that you need. So make sure you're looking at the right consumer. And I think I did this back in February when I take you back to uh, feeder calf sales. You know, we're all familiar with um, sale barns uh, and feeders. 
feeder sales and really auctions are a great almost like an experiment to determine consumer willingness to pay uh, and we can see that experiment play itself out you know live as bidders bid so i did research for six years on feeder calf prices where i graded uh, every pen of calves that came into the sale barn uh, like i said for six years we graded them those calves for 13 different traits including what time of day, you know, how early in the auction they were being sold, how many head were in there, body condition score, you know, breed, hide color, vaccination status, uh, and so on. And then we statistically determined uh, the, the value of each characteristic of a pen of calves. And so uh, kind of sort of saying here, what's the difference between calves that receive low and high prices? What we found in that in that you know huge study with lots lots of observations was that the buyers were willing to pay higher prices for good bull genetics, body condition score, bulls that had been castrated, animals that had been weaned, and you know the joke is actually weaned, not weaned on the trailer ride to the sale barn, started on feed and then vaccinated and boosted. When the buyer saw these qualities they bid higher and paid higher prices. So that's just a reminder because you've seen it in action that when you design a product that satisfies your consumer, and that includes your communication effort, the convenience, the ease of ordering and so on, that their willingness to pay does increase because you've seen that in the sale barn and the same thinking applies to consumers. In fact, um, we recently produced a publication it's called uh, creating consumer friendly bulk. And I, I only grabbed this graphic to show that um, your level of marketing effort uh, there and, and on the left and green, as it increases, so does the level of consumer service, customer service, but also so does on the far right, the price per pound that you can charge because consumers will pay for products that are easy to order, uh, easy to pay for, easy to receive, and that suit them. So just think of that, you know, supporting your prices with your marketing effort. Remember that consumers do not buy locally raised meat or differentiated meat based on price alone. They are motivated by other factors. Take the time to understand your consumer and develop products to satisfy them. Then focus your marketing decisions and your marketing activities on your target consumer with effective communication. There, um, this is everything that you need to, all the data that you need to gather to use the meat price calculator. It is all on the meat price calculator website under the get prepared tab. So I'm not gonna review that now. And then I just want to um, remind everyone that if you're using Chop Local, uh, then you can create an account on the, the meat price calculator, you know, starting tonight. Uh, so you just visit the meat price uh, calculator website choose the tab for create an account, fill in the form, which is just uh, the name of your farm, your, your name, your location, and your email. And then uh, I think there's a user agreement. And then um, your uh, I'll review, I review every application and, and approve it. So I can usually get that done within 24 hours. If you apply at four o'clock on a Friday, you're probably not gonna get approved until Monday. So just keep that in mind, it's just me and uh, I will uh, get it approved. With that said, uh, I can stop the presentation and um, talk about questions. Perfect, I'll go ahead and put our contact information up and share that while we um, work through questions. Yeah, I did have my email there. I, sorry, I didn't uh, draw attention to it, but- No problem. Uh, oh, there it is. Yeah, so anyone that has pricing questions or, or marketing questions, you know, please feel free to contact me uh, by email and I'll definitely uh, reply. Yeah, so with that, um, we'll go ahead and move into the Q&A portion of the evening. So again, go ahead and put your questions um, in the Q&A. Um, the first question kind of came a while ago towards the beginning of the presentation, but when you were talking about um, where you got your data and when you gathered the um, prices from the grocery stores, do you have a good feel for if those um, products were 
from the U.S. or if they were imported? Sure. Um, when it came to the 100% grass-fed lamb or beef, it tended to be imported. Like I said, in the case of lamb, it was New Zealand and Australia. In the case of beef, it was South America. Um, if it was a grain finished, you know, typical no antibiotics, no added hormones beef, then it was from the U.S. Uh, and I even found USA lamb. There was a significantly higher price on USA lamb than on um, Australian. And, and I don't know in depth about the larger scale lamb industry. Um, uh, so I don't, you know, they didn't have 100% uh, grass fed claims on their labels. They really were just that they were US products, mm -hmm. but as high as um, I kind of remember some lamb chops at, you know, 34, 35, $36 a pound whereas the grass-fed ones were coming in lower than that. Uh, and then 100% of the pork was, was USA, and they usually said that right on the label. Hmm. Yeah, Matt, when we talked before, um, we, we were talking about um, a little bit about directing the, the locker when you're, when you're going to process you know, seasonality makes a big difference as well. So, so when you're going into winter, um, that chuck primal, which is a large part of the car carcass, um, you know, if you can break that down into, or in, in going into the winter, if you can leave that in a chuck roast, uh, there's probably more value in that. But going now, we're into grilling season. And so uh, going into grilling season to break that carcass down a little bit more into those, you know, uh, chuck eye steaks and, and other the value. Denver and the ranch. And, yeah. Yeah. Can you, can yeah, you absolutely. expand on that a little bit? I, you said it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I think you said it, you know, um, when, when you use the meat price calculator, you're really using a single cut sheet, you know, from one point in time, but you should vary your cut sheet through the course of a year uh, as you market through different seasons and present different mm -hmm. cuts. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a different style of cooking in the warm weather months and the cold weather months. And um, yeah. I, th I think you hit the nail on the head about how to fabricate some of those primals. Um, something that um, I always think is, is funny is I'll ask a room of producers, you know, what's your best selling cut? And there's always somebody or even a few that will say ground beef uh, when, in terms of beef. And then I'll say, what's the worst selling cut? And there's always a few that will say ground beef. I mean, um, yeah. you know, it's, you can develop really good demand for ground beef. It, yeah. it takes some, um, you know, apparently it takes some work to find out who those consumers are. I, I got to imagine that families with children, you know, go through ground beef. I know that's my household. That's the first thing we eat through is the ground beef because it's so convenient. Yes. Um, and uh, first, so for, if you're one of those people that I guess that feels like you can never move your ground beef. Uh, have hope and <laughs> put some effort into identifying uh, channels that will take it. Yeah. Yeah. We had another question come in here. Um, so is there a formula or is there functionality on the meat price calculator for calculating the cost of the animal? Um, if you're raising it on your own versus if you purchased it from a sale? Yeah, th there isn't. That's a great question. There isn't. Um, and remember this slide where I had all the different enterprises. You've got your breeding herd, your feeding and finishing, and then your, your marketing. Um, so where you begin in on that chain would depend on if the animals are born on your farm or if you're buying them in. I do think that, um, you know, let's say butcher shops, they have the easiest uh, excuse me, uh, they have the easiest cost of production, right? Because if they're buying a finished animal from a farm, they know they're what they paid the farm. If you're buying feeder calves, you don't have to worry about the cost of, you know, keeping a cow and how do you assign a cost to a calf. Um, but I don't have an easy, um, you know, I don't have an easy tool, an easy way to walk through creating that cost of production. We'll say that we're working on a project with Colorado State University to develop a cost of production. I'm calling that cost of production estimator uh, and that should be going live in the coming year and it will be built right into the meat price calculator tool. So you'll be able to find it there when it becomes live. It, it's definitely a challenging question to work on cost of production. 
Yeah. Yeah. There, there's so many va variables there. And, and so, um, you know, there's that opportunity cost that goes in with it. So, you know, I, I pull calves out of the herd that usually go to sell as feeders and I keep them. Well, then I got to pay for feed to, to feed them through, you know, all the way to, to final, you know, final production, final, final date that they're going to the locker. And so when, when, then I've, I've got to assume that risk. And so um, there, I guess what I usually just plug in is that number of, okay, so if I sold, if I sold calves, um, you know, for 232, then that's what I plug in. And, and, and so um, for that cost of production and then, and then, and then add my feed cost to it as, as we go forward. So um, man, I, it, it's, that right now though the feeder calf deal is pretty wild so it's it's uh it's things things change daily yeah thanks for saying that i i do i'm i'm always hesitant but i do tell people to look at market prices you know for example for finished steers and it's it's not safe to conclude that that's your cost of production but it is one substitute right yeah um yeah, so that's that's a good way. And and the other thing is that you can develop your own cost of production accounting. Don't be intimidated by it. And what I really don't like is university ag economists, which I guess I'm one of them, but um <laughs> they well, they want to get into some minutia that can make it seem undoable. And what I'd encourage folks to do is start somewhere with your record keeping, mm. uh, get it on a solid simple and solid basis. And really that's what the meat price calculator tool is. We don't consider every imaginable cost. It's true. We take a, a view that's high enough to not get bogged down in record keeping, but low enough to still be valuable. So develop your own cost accounting for cost of production. And then each year you can incrementally improve your methods a little bit. Um, you know, you don't have to count every hour on the tractor against every pound of meat because that would be maddening but you can develop a system that's meaningful so. another question we have is how many value added products can you create on the calculator yeah as many as many products as you have you can add that additional processing cost too so snack sticks all, anything that you have an additional charge from your processor on you can include it in there there's no, there's no limit. You could have um, a very long list of products and cuts. The, there, so there's no limitation from the tool, but of course you wanna make sure that you're using pounds that really came from that single carcass or that average from the group. Next question, and maybe this is just more looking for your input, um, but Sandra says, I can't find a good price for finished pigs that are raised on pasture. The commodity price doesn't really work as almost all pork is raised under contract. Any thoughts? You know, the, the classic extension answer is it depends <laughs> um, because farm scale and uh, production systems are so highly variable. I, I don't know a great resource. All right, I'll, I'll point at one, which is Penn State University has publications called Ag Alternatives, hmm. and they do research and update those publications every few years. So search Ag Alternatives Penn State online, and I'm sure they have one for pastured pork. They get into uh, very specific enterprises, and they really do a good job. So I would, I would recommend that one, but uh, short of that, I don't, I can't think of a, any great examples. Yeah. It's, it's hard because there's, there is a lot of value add there in those, in those pastured pork uh, scenarios. And so, and there, and there's not a, there's not an open market there. Like, like we used to have where, you know, you would take them to the, to the hog buying station because they, they, they just, typically don't buy them, so. All right, another question here. So um, if you are raising your own beef and then processing in your own processing plant, how would you determine primal pricing when you are producing both high choice and prime grade beef? Mm. 
Hmm. I guess if you're, it would probably, okay. If your cost of production is different based on quality grade, then you would need different price price lists. So the difference really is going to be reflected, I, I assume, in the cost of production. The um, you know slaughter, cut, and wrap are going to presumably be the same. So I would work through the same exercise that we discussed, but I would differentiate between those products. Yeah. And uh, do you have anything to add on that, Mark? Yeah, I, I would just, I guess my my gut instinct would be to to look at what what the open market is, and you know, on on Monday yesterday, uh, primes were a thirty five cent bump. Um, the base price was two seventy two um, for for black headed cattle out of Tama, um, and and primes were a thirty five cent bump. Uh, choice ones were a six six cent bump. And uh, choice twos were were a plus four, and so, I mean, I, I would say you could start there and kind of and build that into the model, um, and and say, okay, well, what other what other value add, you know, scenarios do you have on that on that primal? All right, so I don't know if we. Doesn't look like we have any more um, questions in the chat, um, but I would encourage those of you who are still on, I just posted a link um, in the chat for you all to fill out our survey. I know we've asked this of you um, for each of these webinars, but we really wanna hear um, your feedback from both this webinar and the series as a whole, and then um, just gather you know ideas for future webinars. So. Um, it shouldn't take too long. So if you have the time, we would really appreciate um, hearing your thoughts and feedback. Yeah. I, I the, the one other thing that if there's get any other questions that are coming in here, um, the one other thing that I just want to point out is I just love that additional that processing fee for for things that I use like beef sticks. And 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 those do get costly, but man, do they sell? I mean, they they are. Sure. That's that's a great product to to if you if you're somebody that has some ground beef that is harder to sell, put it in a convenient little thing called a beef stick, and man, they will fly off the shelf. And so they those things are those things are amazing um, for for families on the go, you know, going to soccer or baseball or whatever it is. Um, you know, beef sticks are are an awesome value added product. So I love that 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 you have that functionality in the in the calculator that will account for that extra cost because they they are more expensive. And and when you go from a original beef stick to uh to a you know jalapeno you know chipotle lime whatever it is you know spice blend that goes with it uh, those those they 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 march up in price. So um, I love that part. Right. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, it looks like, like talking uh, about this. So yeah, I'm glad for a place to talk about it. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks so much for for your valuable insight and and for partnering with us on on uh, on, on the calculator and um, Sydney's got some. She can close it up. Yeah. Well, thank you all again for joining us tonight and throughout the last few months. Um, we've really enjoyed this series and hope you have as well. So with that, um, I think we'll wrap things up and have a great night, everyone.